All right. Hi, guys. Welcome to uh, chapter eight. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to look at reproductive uh, strategies. And in this video, we're going to focus on sexual and asexual reproduction. This is the uh, spicy video you've all been waiting for all year, I presume. All right, here we go. All right, so let's uh, start by defining what is sexual reproduction, right? So when we talk about sexual reproduction, we are talking about the formation of new individuals through the union of the gametes, which are your sex cells. Okay, so a gamete in an animal is a sperm and an egg, and in a plant, it is a plant and an ovule. Okay, so any sort of sex cells is referring to a gamete, right? Um, and so if sexual reproduction is when you create new individuals by having these two gametes combined together, then asexual reproduction is simply formation of new individuals without the involvement of these gametes, okay? So here's a here's the bee covered in pollen. Uh, here is an animal sperm, probably a human sperm, and uh, this is just a little cool side thing showing you guys the nanotechnology responsible uh, for aiding sperm to meet the egg. It's a pretty cool little uh, device. Now, uh, when you have two gametes come together, uh, they actually combine their DNA together to fertilize, uh, or the sperm fertilizes the egg to form what we call a zygote, which is your first cell in the new individual, which then goes on to create an embryo, et cetera, et cetera, in animals, okay? Uh, in plants, uh, you can have the same thing, uh, except, uh, you know, instead of sperm and egg, you have a pollen, uh, which is over here, and then the ovule, which is here. Now, both of them are actually on the flower of the plant, and the flower being the sexual reproductive organ of the plant. Um, and when they meet, uh, the pollen of one flower meets the ovule of another flower at the base of the uh, flower stem. Uh, that forms a new seed, which then forms a new plant. Okay. Okay, a bit of a warning. There's some graphic content ahead. Uh, nothing you guys haven't seen though, right? Uh, here is some lions having sex. Uh, lions are pretty remarkable. Uh, you think it's crazy enough that males have to kind of wear this super insulated hot uh, mane over them uh, when it's uh, when the females in heat she she demands that he mates with her about uh, 120 times a day I think that's like once every couple of minutes which is uh, pretty remarkable uh, here is a bear uh, sorry not a bear a cow trying to have sex uh, and clearly not succeeding here is a spider um, I think this is called a nurse web spider um, having sex and that is the male wrapping the female up with his web so that she doesn't kill him because she's bigger than him this is how yabbies have sex. Uh, the yabbies are pretty interesting. The male kind of flips the female over and uh, deposits a little spermatophore, a little packet of sperm over between her legs and then she then lay her eggs through the sperm and fertilizes them. Uh, this is how snails have sex. Uh, they basically kiss and hug and snails are really fascinating in the sense that a lot of them are hermaphrodites, uh, which means they are both sexes at, uh, at once. Uh, and so essentially these are just two individuals having sex together. And this is a uh, school of fish having sex as an orgy, where basically the males just drop sperm into the water, and then the females fly through or swim through the sperm and just lay her eggs to get fertilized. So pretty fascinating. This is a uh, male paradise bird trying to attract the female's attention by doing this funky dance with his wings to try and get her attention. If she's interested, she'll allow him to, to introduce her to his nest and then uh, they will mate uh, and have babies. Uh, if not, she will fly away and he will be very, very sad. Okay, so let's talk about advantages and disadvantages, right? So the main advantage of sexual reproduction is really just genetic diversity. This means that the offspring are going to be genetically different from their parents. Now that is a big advantage. Uh, when you have genetic diversity, you get other things along with it, uh, which are really good for the species. So first of all, you get variation, right? So uh, genetic diversity means that individuals in a population tend to differ one another. The very fact that you look very different from your parents and therefore you uh, will look different from an, the person next to you, etc., etc., in the entire human population means that uh, there are going, all, going to always be a few individuals um, that are able to adapt to changing environments because individuals with that particular advantageous variation, they're gonna survive better. So as a population and as a species as a whole, it is good to have variation because that means you can adapt to your changing environment and you can resist disease better. So individuals with an advantageous variation can be resistant to that particular disease and repopulate despite uh, the disease you kind of making its way through the population, okay? Um, other possible advantages can include uh, parental care. 
where certain species will be able to care for their offspring, increasing their chance of survival. And you can kind of view this as an advantage that there is an accelerated rate of evolution because of the high degree of variation that there is, especially compared to asexual reproduction, okay? There are downsides, obviously. Uh, having, having kids takes a lot of energy. So as your parents would know, uh, it takes a lot of energy to reproduce sexually, both in terms of production of sperm and egg. And then also finding a mate takes a lot of time and effort. Um, uh, so for example, you know, you can kind of see those documentaries where the salmon uh, kind of swim back up the river that they were born in and then they kind of mate and then they all just kind of die en masse. Um, because uh, basically having sex takes up that much of their effort that they end up dying. Um, there's also risk. So threat to your safety uh, because of your sexual endeavors. Uh, for example, finding a mate, like for example frogs, when they call out for their mate could also end up attracting predators. Uh, and then also reproductive competitiveness, right? So these are two elephant seals, uh, males, fighting it out for the right to have a little harem of female along the beach, and then the, the winner gets the reward, the loser either dies or gets chased away and has to live to fight another day, okay? All right, let's take a look at sexual methods uh, for sexual reproduction first, okay? So there are basically two modes of sexual reproduction, the first being external fertilization, where you have fertilization outside of the body, uh, and then you have internal fertilization, which is fertilization uh, inside the body, right? External fertilization usually happens in water. The reason for that is because sperm are motile and they can move around better in water. So therefore, uh, when uh, you have external fertilization, the movement of the water, sorry, the, the presence of water allows sperm to move around quite easily. Uh, the advantage is you can produce them in large quantities, but the downside is that the chance of one sperm and one egg meeting in you know, a, the sea or the ocean or whatever is actually quite low. So therefore, your chance of fertilization and therefore survival is also quite low. Um, on the other hand, you can have internal fertilization where uh, fertilization happens inside the body. Uh, and this means that you can have it both in water and on land. Uh, you can't produce as many eggs, but the eggs have a high chance of being fertilized because the environment in which they meet with the sperm is uh, controlled. So, uh, you know, here's uh, frogs living in a pond and then the male kind of just lays, uh, sorry, the female lays the eggs and then the male kind of drops his sperm over them. Uh, and that is external fertilization. Whereas internal could be like two butterflies uh, kind of meeting at the abdomen um, and then uh, one transferring sperm over to the other one or birds on the other hand, um, they don't have a penis or a vagina, they have what we call a cloaca, which is like basically a hole in which they connect together and the sperm goes across and uh, fertilizes the ovaries, okay? Sorry, fertilizes the egg in the ovaries, which then produces the egg. Okay, uh, reproductive strategies. Now, this isn't um, this isn't particular in the coursework, but I just thought I'd make a mention that, you know, kind of uh, different animals will deploy different strategies for effective sexual reproduction, right? These strategies could uh, kind of be easily summarized as uh, number one, the cheap and many or the R selected strategy or the expensive and few, which is the K selected strategy, right? So the R selected strategy, uh, the letter R really just represents the exponential growth that uh, organisms can have in statistics uh, where you have large quantities of offspring, uh, but there's no parental care involved whatsoever, right? This mainly happens in invertebrates and animals that uh, employ uh, external fertilization um, because what happens is basically you produce heaps and heaps of babies and then you just kind of leave them to their own demise and then uh, they just have to kind of fend for themselves. Uh, and, you know, you expect maybe only a few survive. But that's okay because each of those few will then produce heaps and heaps and more babies as well, okay? Um, on the other hand, you can have a K-selected strategy where uh, you end up producing one or only a few offspring, um, which is really expensive, but you spend a lot of time and effort caring for that offspring to ensure its survival. Now, this occurs mainly in larger animals and vertebrates, uh, and it is effective in a stable environment where you can kind of predict that raising that one young means you're not going to lose it to some sort of freak accident of nature or whatever, right? Um, here is a graph showing the growth curve of the different uh, of the two. So uh, if you were to imagine the population size over time, 
in an R selected species, it can fluctuate quite a bit over time, right? One, one year you might have explosive growth and then something happens and most of them die. You know, the, uh, the, the beach is one degree is too hot or, and then all of your babies die or the, the pool is one degree is too cold or whatever, right? And then the following year, it kind of bounces back up because those who do survive produces on mass. And so the population fluctuates quite, quite often, right? Um, you know, uh, on the other hand, the K selector species, the population slowly increases over time because, um, the babies are more likely to survive and they're more likely to have, uh, offspring of their own when they become adults. And then that keeps going until eventually you reach what we call carrying capacity, which is kind of like, uh, the cap on a population because of limited resources like space, uh, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so the K selector species are going to grow until they reach that and they'll stabilize and taper off, right? Um, here's a survivorship curve showing basically uh, how likely it is that they survive across their maximum lifespan. And, you know, in an R-selected species, um, most of the time, uh, the population will just kind of plummet right from the start. And most individuals are dead by the time that, you know, they, 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 they kind of reach adulthood. And then the very few adulthood will, will continue living on for the rest of their lives. On the other hand, K-selected species are more likely to survive all the way into adulthood, but then they just cock it right at the very end because they get to old age and they just die, right? Um, now, an animal isn't necessarily only R or only K, but they're on a spectrum where, you know, kind of some, some animals will have tons and tons and tons, and then others will only have one over every, you know, couple of years or something like that. And you can have every animal in between, okay? Um, now, once an animal kind of has an adaptation, it's, it's, it's quite genetic as it's not something that the animal can choose to do, uh, for the most part. It is just kind of how it as a species adapts. Um, all right. So that was sexual reproduction. We're going to look at asexual reproduction. Now, asexual reproduction, uh, does not involve the joining of gametes. Uh, now this means you only have one parent. You don't need two individuals to do it. Uh, you only have one parent and that one parent is going to produce genetically identical offspring because there is no, uh, other mate to introduce different genes to it. Uh, therefore the, the offspring, which we often refer to as daughters are actually clones of the parent. Okay. Now the advantage of asexual reproduction is that you only need one parent. Uh, therefore you don't need to look for a mate and you don't have to compete for a mate. Uh, and you can just produce babies whenever you want. This makes it faster, takes less time to reproduce, and you can populate a particular environment quite rapidly as a result of that. Now, if you ever grow plants, you will see this in action because the moment the plants uh, or vegetables or whatever gets one aphid, if you leave that one aphid alone, one becomes two, two becomes four, and uh, next thing you know, the whole thing's, the whole plant's full of aphids, and then you've got a bit of a, a problem on your hands that you have to try and get rid of with some soapy water, okay? Um, now, advantages also include that, uh, you know, because it is one parent and is faster in fairly favorable conditions that are stable and predictable, the, ex the, the population just explodes, right? So a very stable year or a stable season or whatever means that the population can reproduce on mass. Um, so, you know, if at the perfect temperature, you know, you have one bacteria and then that one bacteria quickly after one day becomes 11,000 bacteria, right? So that's, that's not a lot of fun for, for you and I, especially if that bacteria is a pathogen. Um, the disadvantages on the other hand is that you don't have any genetic variation, which means you are susceptible to disease and you are unable to adapt to a changing environment, which means uh, as a population, individuals that use asexual reproduction uh, find it difficult to uh, to grow in unstable or unpredictable uh, conditions. Okay. Now, some animals can deploy both. So, for example, strawberries can 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 be both uh, sexual and asexual. You know, they can produce. Oops, my bad. Uh, they can produce flowers just like uh, every other plant does. Um, almost every other plant. Uh, and then those flowers can you know uh, ha be pollinated and produce new plants uh, out of strawberries, or they can actually reproduce asexually through this thing called a runner, which I will talk about later, which produces a clone plant, and that clone plant can become independent of the parent plant, okay? Okay, we're gonna go, few, uh, go through a few sets, uh, some of them which are fairly brief uh, methods of sexual, uh, sorry, of asexual reproduction, uh, which goes from fission, budding, fragmentation, spores, vegetative propagation, and parthenogenesis. And each of these methods are deployed by either plants, animals, or fungi, or any combination of them uh, as well. Uh, let's start with fission. Fission is really when you have one parent that divides into multiple cells. Now, usually bacteria and single-celled organisms do this. 
Um, and in general, it's quite a simplistic division where you have the one cell, the one cell kind of like mitosis, but a really simple version of mitosis just kind of divides up the DNA in the middle and the, the, the different parts. And then they just split off into two cells and then the two cells will regrow in size and then it just keeps repeating itself. Right. Um, now if you have one dividing into two, we call that binary. So for example, this here is a form of binary, uh, fission, which is in bacteria. Um, and this happens once, uh, literally once every 20 minutes, which is why you can go from two to 11,000 within one day. And then you can also have multiple fission, right? Which is, um, which is, uh, like a C anemone, which can then break up into multiple individuals as opposed to just two. Okay. Um, budding is when you have a new individual, which forms as a bit of an outgrowth from the parent individual. And then eventually just breaks off and forms its own individual, right? So, so, you know, this little bud, uh, here in this hydra, uh, will then kind of grow off the side of the parent. And then once it grows big enough, it'll just break off and then it'll just latch itself onto the glass and become its own individual, right? Uh, and so this is, uh, this is it happening in hydra and, uh, there is the hydra bud, right? And then there's the parent individual. And then this is it happening in yeast where the new bud is breaking off from the old one and then it's going to reproduce in that kind of way, right? So yeast is the stuff that we put in bread and then hydra is the stuff that you normally see in fish ponds in the side of fish tanks and stuff like that. Uh, this is also where the, the, the concept of the hydra, um, sorry, it, this was named after the concept of the hydra, which is the, the ancient Greek monster that, you know, if you cut off one head, more will grow in its place, uh, kind of like the Marvel uh, criminal organization. Okay. Uh, fragmentation. So fragmentation is when the parent breaks into tiny fragments and then each fragment then slowly regenerates into a new individual. Uh, it's similar to fission, but it mainly happens in multicellular organisms, right? So for example, this is a flatworm and a flatworm. If you cut a flat flatworm into three pieces, each of those pieces is, even if it's got like the hair, the, you know, the middle bit and the tail is going to then regrow into a new individual provided it has the right resources, right? So, so that's kind of how flatworms are able to reproduce by fragmentation. Another good example is a starfish. So a starfish, uh, this here is a starfish with kind of one of the, its original arms and then five new little baby arms. Uh, this is the same one here with three new baby arms and basically so long as a part of the central disc is in place, you can break a starfish in any which way, and then it's going to regrow those particular parts if the central disc remains intact. Okay. Now, uh, spores. So spores are a type of a, a release of reproductive cells. And then those reproductive cells can then go on to produce new individuals without the need of fertilization. Uh, so this can happen in bacterial spores, fungal spores, algal spores, and plant spores. Um, this here is a fungal spore, which looks very quite gross, uh, you know, kind of spraying itself out into this little mist. And then that's going to land somewhere. And then it's going to regrow into what we call a mycelium, which is an underground network. And then eventually you're going to get a, a, a mushroom kind of cap, which is the spore. And then that's going to release and, and kind of, uh, life cycle its way through. Okay. Uh, plants can also uh, release spores. So for example, ferns, ferns don't actually produce flowers. They actually end up producing these little spores and these little spores get released and they then can reproduce asexually and, and, um, land on the ground and form new ferns. Okay. Uh, vegetative propagation. Now this is really, uh, talking about plants, uh, where you have the growth of specialized tissues that are able to form new plants. Um, and basically it's like, if you just cut off a piece of the plant and then you just chuck it somewhere and it grows into a new plant, that's vegetative propagation. Okay. Now this doesn't happen with every part of the plant. It only happens with specialized tissues, uh, in certain areas. So for example, uh, there are basically three types. Uh, there are rhizomes. So rhizomes are underground stems or branches that can develop into new shoots and roots. So ginger, for example, uh, here is a ginger uh, rhizome. And basically if you just get a piece of this and you cut it and you stick it somewhere, it's going to grow a new shoot out of it. Uh, turmeric and asparagus are also rhizomes. Uh, stolons are basically, uh, the same thing, but above the ground and a stolon, um, will, will kind of run, uh, you know, like a, like a runner either, uh, above the ground or just underneath the ground. And then it's going to 
kind of pop itself back up and form a new clone there. So the difference between a stolen uh, and a rhizome is that the stolen still kind of needs to be attached to the parent as it's growing until you get a new root system and the plant becomes more independent. But here is the strawberry stolen, which is what we call a runner. Uh, and strawberries will release this, um, you know, depending on various conditions, environmental conditions that they experience, and then you get a new plant. In fact, it's a faster way to grow strawberries than actually just getting them to flower. But uh, this individual is just still just a clone of the parent, okay? Uh, tubers. Tubers are underground buds and they form into new plants. Uh, it's like a storage compartment that can shoot out new in, uh, plants from it. Potatoes, carrots, uh, radish, parsnips, beetroot, all of those kind of bulbous kind of vegetables that you and I eat, they're all tubers and they will form new plants. So you can see sometimes you leave a potato too long in the dark or whatever and then sprouts off a green bud and then that green bud can easily become a plant if you stick it into the ground and grow it, okay? Now, the last one, uh, which I think is the coolest method of asexual reproduction is parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis um, uh, happens in animals, right? Where you actually get the development of an unfertilized egg into an offspring. So there's no sperm and therefore it's asexual, but uh, you still involve one of the gametes, which is the egg, right? Um, now, because it involves an unfertilized egg and no sperm, it only happens in females. Um, and what happens is the eggs are either going to develop as a diploid egg or start off as haploid, but then they fuse with another oocyte and they end up becoming a diploid, merging the DNA together to become D, uh, 2N, okay? Uh, and so uh, this is the two methods. So you can see here, uh, this one is uh, the individual where it fuses with another oocyte and you get 2N again, whereas this one, you just it just it comes preset with, a diploid number and then it stays as a diploid egg okay a lot of insects and reptiles uh, deploy this method so this is the spiny leaf insect and they uh, in certain conditions will also undergo parthenogenesis particularly if a population is um, if a population individual is experiencing environmental difficulty they will just uh, yeah, reproduce asexually. Uh, this is a type of whiptail lizard, and uh, what's really interesting is that the species on the left they reproduce sexually, the species on the right reproduces sexually. But then, if you get an interspecial relationship here, uh, producing this particular strand or variation, they reproduce asexually by parthenogenesis, and the entire species is only female uh, and not male, which is pretty cool. All right, uh, that's pretty much it for this particular video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I will see you guys in the next one for 8.2.